Mr. President, Mr. Vice President, it's an obvious pleasure of all of us here to welcome you today. This is uh, something we call in Silicon Graphics an all-hands meeting. We have these almost every month uh, where we get together to talk about how the company uh, is changing and how we're preparing for change in the future. It's uh, Unfortunately, we can't have all of our hands here because we have a lot of guests today. And, and so what we're doing is beaming out this uh, entire program live on video over all of our campus workstations so that the rest of our people can sit at their desk and, uh, and get a feeling for what's happening right here. So it's an indication of what modern technology can do to improve communications. Our company makes uh, very high technology computer workstations that are used by multimedia specialists and uh, engineers and scientists, many other people. And uh, there's uh, a lot about what makes us tick. And what we'd like to do is to start off by sharing that with you, having a few of our people uh, share with you their ideas about uh, just what, how we do things. So since we're a high technology company, what we've got here are some manufacturing people and some finance people and some human resources people and engineering and marketing and sales. Since we're a high technology company, let's start off with engineering. So to start it off, uh, let's have a couple of our founders, Kurt Akeley and Mark Hanna, uh, give you a feeling for what makes us special in engineering. Kurt? Mr. President, Mr. Vice President, great to have you here. Silicon Graphics engineers love what they do. I think a lot of the reason why they do is we don't tell them how to do it. We don't tell them when to come to work. We don't tell them exactly what to wear to work. You can see? <laughs> <laughs> and we don't tell them what to do at work. There's no book of rules. There's no instructions for how we go about designing these great products. Instead, what we do is we hire great people, we give them great tools, and we set them loose to just do it. Our overriding goal here at Silicon Graphics is just to be the very best. And we don't meet, chase after the competition. We go out and talk to our customers to find out what their problems are, what problems they're trying to solve. And then we come back and figure out the best machine to solve their problems. And then we're not just satisfied with a, a factor of two or three improvement when we're going from one generation to the next. We go for an order of magnitude, a factor of 10. We're looking for something that's going to substantially change the way people do their jobs. Thanks, Mark. So that's engineering. Engineering isn't enough. Today you have to do high quality, low cost products to be competitive in the global marketplaces. So I believe we have over uh, a live link uh, a little pic a view of our manufacturing facility, uh, which is being con reconstructed right now, a new American manufacturing facility. So Steve, are you there? Good morning, Mr. President and Vice President. I'm Steve Gojano. On behalf of all the great team, manufacturing team in, in, um, at Silicon Graphics, I welcome you to tour Building 11, manufacturing site. There's two significant reasons we're touring the manufacturing site in Building 11. One is it currently houses the high volume production lines for the Indigo product line and also for the newly introduced Indigo 2 product line. Second reason is, we, as, as Ed mentioned, we are making significant reinvestments in this building into the retooling of our manufacturing capability. This building will, will have uh, much capability and we're going to do it right here in California. Let me quickly take you through the current Indigo production process, starting with the board, board level test that currently is run for approximately a half hour at 60 degrees centigrade. The boards then are, are quickly integrated into the chassis for the first time and will play with disk drives, memory, and act as a system for the first time. We actually boot the, unit, the units up on, the, on the, the bench, and the units then go into the systems run in test bays, which look like this. The system run in test bays are run now at 45 degrees centigrade for an interval time of between 16 to 24 hours. The units then are, are pulled out of the test bays, put back onto the production line, skinned, boxed, and packed out, and then sent over to our distribution location. And as you can tell, we also have a fondness for, for the saxophone. Speaking specifically to the uh, manufacturing capability, what you see here is our investment in retooling. Behind the uh, American flag, we'll have an automated retrieval uh, system, which will be in in a couple months, which will be fed by these uh, automated conveyor lines. Incidentally, these automated conveyor lines were, were purchased recently from a company called Hytrol in Jonesboro, Arkansas. In closing, in closing, I'd like to uh, obviously thank you for uh, viewing our manufacturing site. We are very proud of our people. 
We have the greatest manufacturing people in the world. Thank you. Thanks, Dave. Thanks, Dave. Uh, this kind of high technology company needs a different kind of people environment than has been traditional in American business. And Lilani Gales will give us a little feeling for what it's like uh, to work here. Lilani? Mr. President and Mr. Vice President, people are extremely important at SGI. As a matter of fact, we just can't live without them. Um, <laughs> We have a situation where we're constantly reinventing ourselves and our products, so we really need high creativity, high energy, and healthy employees. So we've created a real special environment here. The environment allows high employee involvement. What that means is that people at any level within the organization have a chance to participate and contribute, and it's expected. That's how we get things done so quickly around here. We trust our employees. We trust each other. We just trust people to do the right thing. Doing the right thing means open communication and sharing as much information as possible. We seek solutions rather than blame here. And then finally, we really enjoy our diversity by getting all people involved. And that's what really makes this place special. Silicon Graphics really focuses in on the environment. And how we do that is each year we have employees nominate their peers. And they represent the people who best embody the spirit of SGI. We also, every four years, provide a six-week paid sabbatical. And that's so our people can recharge themselves. <laughs> That's so our people can really recharge themselves. And if you can believe it, sometimes we have to make certain people take it. <laughs> so put very simply, this place is challenging work. It's a dynamic environment. Our culture is really special and unique here. And you know, people just love working here. Hey, all right. So the next thing we need are customers. None of this makes any sense unless we have customers. And so Dave Bagshaw is going to give us a feeling for marketing and sales. Dave? Our marketing and sales organizations are made up of people that really care about our products and our customers. But there are some really important things that set us apart. The first one is our passion. We have an incredible passion for our products. And we use our products in all of our marketing and sales activity. And that passion rubs off on our customers. The second thing that we do that sets us apart is that we take a non-traditional approach. We're always trying to figure out a new way of doing things. And I have two examples of that. A few years ago, we invented the Magic Bus. This is an 80-foot semi with our best workstations staffed with our best people. And with the Magic Bus, we can take our message and our products right to our customers' parking lots. And even though you didn't ask for permission, um, <laughs> we were really delighted that you borrowed that idea during the campaign. <laughs> Another unique approach, you know? We're the only company in the world. <laughs> we're the only company in the world that doesn't paint our systems boring beige or flat black. We give them strong, vibrant colors that our customers can really get attached to. And we give them interesting names like Indigo, Reality Engine, and Power Challenge, instead of the traditional names that you'd expect from a traditional computer company like Model 1200, for example. So those are the kinds of things that we do to reinvent marketing and sales at Silicon Graphics. One of the w secrets here, I think, to uh, our organization is that we like to split up into small teams, teams of from five or ten people to a few hundred people that are multidisciplinary, that can look at a problem and a technology and really match them together. And we've recently done that to get into the supercomputing business, which is a brand new business for our company. And uh, let me introduce John Brennan, who's going to give you a feeling for, uh, for what, we do, what we're doing in this team, what it's like to work on this team. Hi, it's a pleasure to have you here. Um, a year and a half or two years ago, we were given the, the direction to basically go out and reinvent how supercomputing was going to be done, um, which is a pretty lofty goal. And the way by which we go about doing this to bring all of these organizations together, first of all, we have um, many graphic systems that are in scientific and engineering communities such that we know what the problems that they experience with existing supercomputers, you know, <laughs> both cost and usability. Second, we had to build a 
expertise which didn't exist inside of our company. And the way we do that is to attract the best and the brightest people to get them here. We have the disciplines of, of different organizations all sitting next to one another. So the software development organization is sitting next to the hardware development organization is sitting next to the people developing the microprocessors so that we can make all the proper trade-offs when we're designing the machines. We get manufacturing involved very early in this particular design so that we know that when it's completed, it can actually be built, and it's an important thing. Um, finally, in order to run a project of this type, what we do is try to empower the individuals who are working on the project and to make decisions. And for those who are running the programs, we push the actual authority and responsibility as far down in the organization as is possible so that, so that they have the, you know, decisions can be made quickly, issues can be resolved quickly, and we can move on with getting things done. Um, and this is, this, if you really step back and look at it, what you're doing is running a big project the way that an entrepreneurial company is run. And that's the very same thing which has built this company and the same thing that has built this valley. Uh, so in this particular case, what we have built is a supercomputing system we refer to as the power challenge system. And it's something which is going to put us in a position to be the, the number one vendor of supercomputers in the 1990s. All right. So there you have it, Silicon Graphics. They're all yours. <laughs> thank you very much. Uh, first of all, I want to thank you all for the, uh, for the introduction to your wonderful company. I want to thank Ed and Ken. We saw them last night uh, with a number of other of the executives from Silicon Valley people, uh, many of them with whom I've worked for uh, a good length of time, uh, many of whom the vice president's known for a long time. And, connection with his work on supercomputing and other issues. We came here today for two reasons, and, and since mostly we just want to listen to you, I'll try to state this briefly. The one reason was to pick this setting to announce the implementation of the technology policy we talked about in the campaign as an expression of what we think the national government's role is in creating a partnership with the private sector to generate more of these kinds of companies, more technological advances to keep the United States always on the cutting edge of change and to try to make sure we'll be able to create a lot of good new jobs for the future. Uh, but the second read, can I put that down? We're not ready yet for this. <clears throat> the second reason I wanted to come here is I think the government ought to work like you do. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> and Before that can ever happen, we have to be able to get the people, the Congress, and the press who have to interpret all this to the people to imagine what we're talking about. But uh, I have, for example, the first state government in the country that started a total quality management program in all the departments of government trying to figure out how we could reinvent the government. And I basically believe my job as president is to try to adjust America in good ways so that we can win in the 21st century, so that we can make change our friend and not our enemies. Ed said that, that you plan your new products knowing they'll be obsolete within 12 to 18 months and you want to be able to replace them. We live in an era of constant change and America's biggest problem, if you look at it through that lens, is that for too many people, change is an enemy, not a friend. I mean, one reason you're all so happy is you found a way to make change your friend, right? Diversity is a strength, not a source of division. Right. Change, change is a way to make money, not throw people out of work. Right. If you decentralize and push decisions make to the down to the lowest possible level, you enable every employee to live up to the fullest of their ability. And you don't make them, by giving them a six-week break every four years, you don't force them to make these sharp divisions between your work life and your private life. It's sort of a seamless web. These are things we need to learn in America and we need to incorporate even into more traditional workplaces. So I'd like to start. We'll talk about the technology policy later and the Vice President who's done so much work will talk a lot about the details at the end of this meeting. But I just want to start by telling you that one of our missions in order to make this whole thing work, we're going to have to make the government work differently. Example, we cut the White House staff by 25% to set a uh, standard for cutting inessential spending in the government. But the workload of the White House is way up. We're getting all-time record telephone calls and, 
and letters coming in, and we have to serve our customers too. Our customers are the people that put us there, and if they have to wait three months for a letter to an answer, uh, answer to a letter, that's not service. But when we took office, I walked into the Oval Office, it's supposed to be the nurse center of the United States, and we found Jimmy Carter's telephone system. <laughs> right? No speaker phone, no conference calls, but anybody in the office could punch the lighted button and listen to the president talk. <laughs> so that I could have the conference call I didn't want, but not the one I did. <laughs> See, right. then, <clears throat> then we went down into the basement where we found Lyndon Johnson's switchboard. <laughs> True story, where there were four operators working from early morning to late at night. Literally, when a phone would come in and they'd say, I want to talk to the vice president's office, they would pick up a little cord and push it into a little hole. <laughs> it's got today. <laughs> right? We found uh, procedures that were so bureaucratic and, for, uh, and, and, and cumbersome for procurement that Einstein couldn't figure them out. And all the offices were organized in little closed boxes, just the opposite of what you see. In our campaign, however, we ran an organization in the presidential campaign. It was very much like this. All, most decisions were made in a great big room in morning meetings that we had our senior staff in, but any 20-year-old volunteer who had a good idea could walk right in and say, here's my idea. And some of them were very good, and we incorporated them. And we had a, a man uh, named Ellis Motter who helped us to put together our technology policy who said, you know, he's, he was one of our senior citizens. He was in his 50s. <laughs> and he said, uh, he said, I've been writing about high-performance work organizations all my life, and this is the first one I've ever worked in, and it has no organizational chart. I can't figure out what it looks like on paper, but it works. Uh, the vice president was making fun of me when we were getting ready for the speech I gave Wednesday night to the Congress. It was like making sausage. People were running in and out saying, put this in, take this out. But it, <laughs> but it, but it worked. You know, it worked. And so, so I want... <clears throat> So I want to hear from you, but I want you to know that we have we've hired a person at the Office of Management and Budget who has done a lot of work in creating new businesses and turning businesses around to run the management part of that. We're trying to review all these indictments that have been issued over the last several years about the way the federal government is run. But I want you to know that I think a major part of my mission is to literally change the way the national government works, spends your tax dollars, so that we can invest more and consume less and look toward the future. And that literally will require rethinking everything about the way the government operates. The government operates so much to keep bad things from happening that there's very little energy left in some places to make good things happen. If you spend all your time trying to make sure nothing bad happens, there's very little time and money and human energy left to make good things happen. We're going to try to pare out way a lot of that bureaucracy and speed up the decision-making process and modernize it. And I know a lot of you can help. Technology is a part of that, but so is organization and empowerment, which is something you've taught us again today, and I thank you very much. We want to do a uh, question and answer now, and then the Vice President is going to talk in more detail about our technology policy later. We just, uh, but that's what uh, we and Ed agreed to do. He's my boss today. I'm doing what he <laughs> So I wonder if any of you have a question you want to ask us or a comment you want to make. Yes, go ahead. Yes, now that Silicon Graphics has entered the supercomputer arena, Supercomputers are subject to very stringent and costly export controls. Is part of your agenda to review the export control system, and can industry count on export regulations that will keep pace with technology advances in our changing world? Let me uh, start off on that. Um, as you may know, uh, the President appointed as the Deputy Secretary of Commerce, uh, John Rollwagon, who was the CEO at Cray. And he and Ron Brown, uh, the Secretary of Commerce, have been reviewing a lot of uh, procedures for stimulating U.S. Uh, exports around the world. And we're going to be a very export-oriented administration. Uh, however, we are also going to keep a close eye 
on the legitimate concerns that have in the past limited uh, the free export of some technologies that can make a dramatic difference in the ability of a Gaddafi or a Saddam Hussein to develop uh, nuclear weapons or ICBMs. Now, in some cases in the past, these legitimate concerns have been interpreted and implemented in a way that has frustrated uh, American business unnecessarily. There are, for example, some software packages that are available off the shelf uh, in stores here that are nevertheless prohibited uh, from being exported. And sometimes that's a little bit unrealistic. On the other hand, there are some in business who are understandably so anxious to find new customers that they will uh, not necessarily pay as much attention as they should to what the customer might use this uh, new capacity for. And that's a legitimate role for government to say, hold on, the world will be a much more dangerous place if we have 15 or 20 nuclear powers uh, instead of five or six, and, and if they have ICBMs and so forth. So it's, it's a balance that has to be struck very carefully. Uh, and we are, we're not, we're, we're going to have a tough nonproliferation strategy while we promote more exports. Let me, if I might just add to that, the short answer to your question, of course, is yes, we're going to review this. And let me give you one example. Ken told me last night at dinner that he, he said, you know, if, if we export a substantially the same product to the same person, that we, if we have to get one permit to do it, we'll have to get a permit every time we want to do the same thing over and over again. They always give it to us, but we have to wait six months, and it puts us behind the competitive uh, arc. Now, that's something that ought to be changed, and we'll try to change that. Uh, we also know that some of our export troll controls, rules, and regulations are a function of the realities of the Cold War, which aren't there anymore. But what the Vice President was trying to say, and he said so well, I just want to reemphasize, our biggest security problem in the future may well be the proliferation of nuclear and non-nuclear like biological and chemical weapons of mass destruction to small, uh, by our standards, countries with militant governments who may not care what the damage uh, to their own people could be. So that's something we have to watch very closely. But apart from that, we want to move this much more quickly, and we'll try to slash a lot of the time delays where we ought to be doing these things. Mr. President, Mr. Vice President, you've seen um, scientific visualization in practice here. Um, as a company, we're also very interested in ongoing research in high-performance computing and scientific visualization. Can we expect to see a change in the uh, national scientific agenda that includes scientific visualization? Right now, I don't see the um, scientific visualization as being represented, uh, for example, on the uh, Fix-It Committee. Um, it, it is a good question. One of the people who uh, flew out here with us for this event and for the release of the technology policy uh, in just a few minutes is Dr. Jack Gibbons, who is in the back of the room, the President's Science Advisor and Head of the Office of Science and Technology Policy, and he will be in charge of the Fix-It uh, process. That's an acronym uh, uh, that, uh, what does it stand for, Jack? The uh, Federal Coordinating Council on Science and Engine, what is it? Right, and uh, visualization will play a key role in the deliberations of the Fix-It. We were, we were actually, uh, believe it or not, talking about this a little bit with Dr. Gibbons on the way over here. Uh, I had hearings one time where a scientist used uh, sort of technical terms that he then explained it, made an impression on me. He said, if you tried to describe the human mind in terms applicable to a computer, you'd say it had a, we have a low bit rate but high resolution. <laughs> Meaning, this is one of the few audiences I can use that line with. <laughs> but he went on to explain what that means when we try to absorb information bit by bit, uh, w we don't have a huge capacity to do it. That's why the telephone company, after extensive uh, studies, decided that seven numbers were 
the most that we could keep in short-term memory. And then they added three more. Uh, <laughs> but if we can see lots of information portrayed visually in a pattern or a mosaic uh, where each bit of data relates to all of the others, we can instantly absorb a lot of information. We can all recognize the Milky Way, for example, even though there are trillions uh, uh, of, uh, of points of light, stars, and so forth. And so the, the, uh, the idea of incorporating visualization as a key component of this uh, strategy is one that, that we re recognize is very important. We're going to pursue it. <clears throat> Let me just add one thing to that. F first of all, I told the crowd last night that the vice president was the only person ever to hold national office in America who knew what the gestalt of a gigabit is. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway. And now we're going to get some very funny articles out of this. They're going to make fun of us for being policy ones. Uh, uh, let, let me say uh, something to sort of take this one step further. This whole visualization movement that you have been a part of in your line of work is going to merge in a very short time with the whole uh, business in traditional education theory called applied academics. We're now finding with just sort of basic computer work in the in the elementary schools of our country. Dramatic differences in learning curves among people who can see the work they're doing as opposed to people who are supposed to read it. And we're now finding that the IQs of young people who might take a vocational track in school may not be all that different from kids that would stay in a traditional academic track and wind up at Stanford, but their learning patterns are dramatically different. And there are some people, th th this is a huge uh, new discovery basically that's coming into the whole business of traditional educational theory. So someday what you're doing here will revolutionize the basic teaching uh, in our schools starting at kindergarten and going forward so that the world of work and the world of education will begin to be merged backwards all the way to the beginning. And it's going to be, I think, the most important thing we've ever done and very important for proving that in a diverse population all people can eat, uh, reach very high levels of achievement. The President and Vice President have also come here today to present a new national technology policy for the country. Uh, do you want to? Okay. I will. Uh, I'm going to forego my time and just let him announce the policy so we can hear some more questions. Got to give men equal time. Well, I just like to say uh, I didn't vote for you. I wish I had. <laughs> And, uh, I hope you feel that way four years from now. <laughs> <I> <laughs> well, that's actually why I'm standing up. I, I really see a possibility in what you stand for, and I really think uh, this is why you were elected, that uh, you say you stand for change. You said that during your campaign. I think the company believed that. They're counting on you. Uh, I'm nervous. <laughs> and I just want to say that we're, we're really, as a country, behind you. I think that's why the statistics are saying that we're willing to have our taxes increase. We're willing to have cuts because you say you're really going to do it this time and decrease the deficit. I hope to God that you do. We need it not just for this present time, but by your actually fulfilling on this, it will take, make a major change in how we feel about government, that when government says they're going to make a difference and they really come through, it will make a huge impact for the future. And I'm really personally behind you all the way. I wish I'd voted for you. Thank you. I really appreciate that. Let me make, let me make one comment in response, if I might. I think it's important, and you can help others understand this, to understand why we have to reduce the deficit, which is something that is normally not done when unemployment is high. And unemployment is still too high, even though we're in an economic recovery. Most of our recovery is due to higher productivity from firms that, in turn, this time, are not hiring new people for all kinds of reasons. And we have to reduce the deficit for two reasons. Number one, if we don't, we're already spending 15% of your tax money just to pay interest on past debt. If we don't change present patterns, we'll be over 20 cents by the year 2000. That's money we should be spending on education and technology in the future. Number two, the more money we take out of the pool of, of funds for borrowing, the more expensive it is for companies like this and other companies that have to go into the markets and borrow to borrow. Just since the election, since we made it clear we were going to try to bring the deficit down, long-term interest rates have dropped seven-tenths of one percent. 
that, that is a huge savings for everybody that is going to borrow money or that has a variable interest rate on a loan, whether it's a home mortgage or a business loan or a car loan or whatever. That's important. The second thing we're trying to increase the deficit first through defense expenses and then through exploding health care costs and increasing interest payments, but we reduced our investments in the future and the things that make us richer. So those are the changes we're trying to affect. Let me just make one other point. I will not support raising anybody's taxes unless the budget cuts also pass. <laughs> now what? Go ahead. Do you have a question? Yeah. Me, yes, sir. Go ahead. One of the things that Silicon Graphics has been really successful in is selling into the international markets. Approximately 50% of our revenues come internationally, including a substantial market in Japan. What types of programs does your administration plan to help the high growth companies of the 90s sell to the international markets? Two things. First of all, we intend to try to open new markets and new markets in our region. That is, I believe that high growth companies are going to, to keep America growing. I believe high growth companies are going to have to sell south of the border more. And to do that, we have to, do th we have to negotiate trade agreements that will help to raise incomes in those countries even as we are growing. That's why I support, uh, with some extra agreements, the NAFTA agreement. And why I hope we can have an agreement with Chile and hope we can have an agreement with other countries like Argentina that are taking a serious effort to build market economies because we want to build new markets for all of you. Uh, with Japan, I think what we have to do is to try to continue to help more companies figure out how to do business there and keep pushing them to open their markets. I don't want to close American markets to Japanese products, but it is the only nation with which we have a persistent and unchanging structural deficit. The product deficit with Japan is not $43 billion, which is our overall trade deficit. It's actually about $60 billion in, in product, in manufactured production. So we have, we've got a lot of problems we have to work out there. With Europe, we sometimes are in surplus, we're sometimes in deficit, but it's a floating thing. So it's more or less in balance. With developing nations like Taiwan and Korea, those countries had big surpluses with us, but as they became richer, they brought them down so that we're more or less in balance. We have our biggest trade relationship with Canada, and we're more or less in balance. So we have to work on this Japanese issue while trying to help more of you get involved. Let, let me make one final comment on that. I think we should devote more government resources to helping small and medium-sized companies figure out how to trade. Because that's what the, the Germans do with such great success and why they're one of the great exporters of the world. They don't waste a lot of money on the real big companies that already figured it out, but they have extra efforts for small and medium-sized companies to get them to think global from the beginning of their endeavors. And I think we're going to have to do more of that. In addition to concerns about the economy, Silicon Graphics employees are also concerned about the environment. Your economic plan does a great job of promoting R&D investment, but are there any elements that are specifically targeted to promote the application of Silicon Graphics technology to environmental friendly initiatives such as the electric car or the maglev train? Yeah, I think I should let the Vice President answer that since it's his consuming passion. And if I do it, his book sales will go up again. <laughs> no, the seri we, we devoted a lot of time and attention to that because for two reasons. One is the environment needs it. Secondly, we think it's wonderful economics because I believe that all these environmental opportunities that are out there for us represent a major chunk of what people who used to be involved in defense technologies could be doing in the future if we're going to maintain a high wage base in America. So I'd like for the Vice President to talk a little about the specifics that we're working on. That goal is integrated uh, into the technology plan as one of our key objectives. The Japanese and the Germans are now openly saying that the biggest new market in the history of world business is the market for the new products, technologies, and processes that foster economic progress without uh, environmental destruction. Some have compared the drive for environmental efficiency to the movement for uh, quality control and the quality revolution in the, in the 60s uh, and 70s. 
at that time, you know, many companies in the United States felt that the existing level of product quality was more or less ordained by the forces of supply and demand, and it couldn't be improved without taking it out of the bottom line. But the Japanese taking U.S. innovations from Dr. Deming and others uh, began to introduce a new theory of product quality uh, and simultaneously improved quality, profits, uh, wages, and productivity. The environmental challenge now presents us with the same opportunity. By introducing new attention to environmental efficiency at every step along the way, we can simultaneously reduce the impact of all our processes on the environment, improve environmental efficiency, and improve productivity at the same time. We need to set clear, specific goals in the technology policy, in the economic plan, and you know the, the, uh, pro both the stimulus package and the investment package focus a great deal on uh, environmental cleanup and environmental innovation. And whereas we've talked a lot about roads and bridges uh, in the past, and they're a big part of this plan, also, we're putting relatively more emphasis as well on water lines and sewer lines and water treatment plants and renovating uh, the, the uh, facilities in the national parks and cleaning up trails, taking kids from inner cities and putting them to, to work cleaning up uh, trails in national parks, for example, as part of the summer jobs program. So you'll find when you look at the, both the technology plan and the economic plan an enormous emphasis on the environment. Go ahead, sir. They say we have to quit in a minute. I, I will, uh, I'll take one more question after this. Mr. President, Mr. Vice President, uh, the news stories and articles that uh, the public has access to regarding the budget and the economy are very often confusing and contradictory. Um, I might explain it in, in the same terms that you used. Uh, the information is delivered low bit rate, but the problem is huge and requires a high res view. So my question is, I wonder, if um, you're using Lyndon Johnson's computer to analyze uh, the budget and the economy, uh, or whether or not it might be open to using some of the things you've seen here to get the bigger picture and also communicate that to us. Well, thank you. There are two things I'd like to respond to on that, and I'd like to invite you to help. I'd like to invite you to help, and I'd like to invite you to help on two grounds. One is the simple ground of helping to decide which visual images best capture the reality of where we are and where we're going. Senator Moynihan and I went to Franklin Roosevelt's uh, home in Hyde Park, New York, just a couple of days ago. You may have seen the press on it. And on the way back, he said to me that the challenges that we face are different from those that Roosevelt faced, but just as profound. Unemployment was higher, and America was more devastated when he took office, he said, but everybody knew what the problem was. Therefore, he had a lot of leeway working with the Congress in the beginning to work toward a solution. Now, he said, we are facing severe challenges to a century of economic leadership, and it's not clear to every American exactly what the dimensions of the problem are. The, 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 little, the, 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 the capacity you have to help me help the American people conceptualize this is quite significant, showing the trends in the deficit, showing the trends in the investment, showing the, how the money is spent now and how we propose to spend it. The second big problem we have, you can see if you look at the front page of USA Today, today which shows a traditional analysis, yesterday's analysis uh, of the business section of the economic program, basically says, oh, it'll bring unemployment down a little and it'll increase economic growth a little if we do this, but not all that much. Now, why is that? That's because traditional economic analysis says that the only way the government can ever help the economy grow is by spending more money and taxing less. In other words, traditional Keynesian economics, run a bigger deficit. But we can't do that. The deficit's already so big, I can't run the risk to the long-term stability of this country by going in and doing that. This analysis doesn't really make a distinction between investment and consumption doesn't take any account of what we might do with a technology policy or a trade policy to make the economy grow faster, has no way of factoring in what other good things could happen in the private market if you brought long-term interest rates down through the deficit. So you could also help us to reconceptualize this. A lot of the models that dominate policymaking are yesterday's models, too. 
I'll give you just one example. The, the Japanese had a deficit about as big as ours, and they were increasing spending at 19% a year of government spending back in the early 70s when the oil prices went way up and they were more energy dependent than we were on foreign oil. And they just decided they had to change it, but they couldn't stop investing. So they had a budget which drew a big distinction, a literal distinction, legal distinction between investment and consumption, and they embarked on a 10 or 11 year effort to bring the budget into balance. And during that time, they increased investment and lowered unemployment and increased growth through the right kind of spending and investment. And I, that's, I want to lead in, if I might, to, and ask the Vice President before we go to, some, to give you some of the specifics of this technology policy by making one more pitch to you about this whole economic plan. This plan has 150 specific budget cuts. And I would be welcome, I'm welcome to more. I, I told the Republican leadership, if they had more budget cuts that didn't compromise our economy, if they helped us, I would be glad to embrace them. I'm not hung up about that, but <laughs> I did pretty good in four weeks to find 150, and I'll try to find some more on my own. It also has the revenue increases that you know about. It also has some spending increases. And there will be debate about that. There will be people who say, well, just don't spend this new money. Don't immunize all the kids. Don't fully fund Head Start. Don't pay for this technology policy. Don't invest in all these environmental cleanup things. And then, well, you want it to raise taxes so much. The problem is, if you look at the historic spending trends, we are too low on investment and too high on the deficit, and both are problems. And secondly, we've got to have some of these economic cooperations in order to move the economy forward. So I want you to listen to what the Vice President says in that context, because what you will hear is we don't need to do what we think we should do in this area. If we don't, I think we'll be out of competition. People like you will do fine because you've got a great run, a good company here, but the country as a whole will fall behind. And you, you can help on both those points. So would you proceed? I want to give you just a few uh, of the details of this technology policy. There will be a printed copy available and you will be able to see for yourself all of the goals and all of the elements of it. But I want to start by describing how it fits into the President's economic plan. You know, some of the special interests who oppose the President's plan are saying to the American people, don't pass this plan because everything is fine just the way it is. Well, anybody who says everything's fine with our economy hasn't been to California lately. We need some change. We can't stand the status quo. California has to participate in the recovery in order for America to have a recovery that is worth the name recovery so that we can start creating new jobs. And many of the, of the high-skill, high-wage jobs of the future are in technology areas. And that's why a key component of the President's economic plan is the technology policy that we're announcing here today. It starts with an appreciation of the importance of continuing basic R&D, because that's the, the foundation for all of the exciting products that this company and others like this company come up with. Uh, it continues with an emphasis on improving education, because in order for companies like this one to survive and prosper in the world economy, we as a nation have to have highly educated, well-trained young men and women coming out of colleges onto campuses like this. It's not called uh, the, you call it a campus, right? That's the, the uh, term that's very common now. Uh, we, we also have to pay attention to the financial environment in which companies like this have to exist. In order for this company to attract investors for the kind of products that you are building here, you have got to be able to, to uh, tell them that the interest rates are not going to be too high if they're borrowing money to invest. You've got to be able to tell them, look, uh, President Clinton is uh, making permanent the uh, uh, R&E tax credit, for example, uh, and there are going to be specific new uh, provisions in the law to encourage investment in high-risk uh, ventures that are very common in the high technology area. And then 
this plan makes specific investments in something called the National Information Infrastructure. Now, infrastructure is a $5 word that ha used to describe roads, bridges, water lines, and sewer lines. But if we're going to compete in the 21st century, we have to invest in a new kind of infrastructure. During the Industrial Revolution, the nations that competed most successfully were often ones that uh, did the best job of uh, building deep water ports, those that did the best job of putting in good railway systems to carry the, the coal and the, the products uh, uh, to the major uh, centers where they were going to be uh, sold and consumed. But now we are seeing a change in the definition of commerce. Technology plays a much more important role. Information plays a much more important role. And one of the things that this plan calls for is the rapid completion of a nationwide network of information superhighways so that the kind of uh, So, so that the kind of demonstrations that we saw upstairs will be accessible uh, in everybody's home. We want to make it possible for a school child to come home after class uh, and instead of just playing uh, Nintendo, uh, to plug into a digital library uh, that has color moving graphics that respond interactively to that child's curiosity. Now, that's not the only reason to have such a network or a national information infrastructure. Uh, think about uh, the importance of software. If we could make it possible for talented young software writers uh, here in Silicon Valley and elsewhere in the United States to sell their latest product by downloading it from their desk into a nationwide network that represented a marketplace with an outlet right there in that person's uh, home or business, we would make it possible uh, for the, the men and women who are interested in technology jobs here in the United States to really thrive and prosper. And in keeping with one of the questions that was asked earlier about how we can export more into the world marketplace and how we can be more successful in world competition, one way is by making our own domestic market the most challenging, most exciting, with the most exacting standards and levels of quality of any nation in the world, and then we will naturally roll out of our domestic marketplace into the world marketplace and compete successfully with uh, our counterparts everywhere in the world. Now there are some other specific elements of this pack package which you can uh, read for yourself when you see the, uh, when, when you see the formal package. Let me just list them uh, very briefly. A permanent extension of the research and experim experimentation uh, tax credit, completion of the national information infrastructure, specific uh, investments in advanced manufacturing technology with measures such as uh, And uh, in response to uh, one of the questions that was asked o over here, there is a specific program on high-speed rail to, uh, to do the work necessary to lay the foundation for a nationwide network of high-speed rail transportation and uh, a specific project to work cooperatively uh, with the automobile companies in the United States of America to facilitate the more rapid uh, development of a new generation uh, of automobiles that will beat all the world standards and position our automobile industry to dominate the automobile industry of the future uh, in the world. We also have a specific goal to apply technology to education and training. Uh, Dr. Gibbons and others have given a tremendous amount of thought to this because after all of the uh, dashed hopes and false expectations for computers in schools, ironically, we now have a new generation of uh, educational uh, hardware and software that really can make a revolutionary difference in the classroom, and it's time to use it. <laughs> and
And uh, we are going to save billions of dollars each year uh, partway through this decade with the full implementation of environmental uh, technologies and energy efficiency uh, technologies, starting with federal buildings. We are going to save a billion dollars a year in 1997 just in the energy cost of federal buildings around the United States by using off-the-shelf technology that has a four-year payback on the investment. And then we are going to encourage the use of those technologies around the country, and we are going to invest in the more rapid creation of new generations of that technology. Now, the other details of this uh, technology program will be available in the handout that is uh, going to be uh, uh, passed out uh, here. And any of you who have ideas on how we can improve it and make better use of technology, we invite you to uh, contact us uh, and, and, and let us know how we can improve this program as we go along. But one final word. The President's economic program is based, as he said, on cutting spending, reducing the deficit uh, over time, including with some revenue increases that are progressive and fair, and also investing in those things which we know will create good, high-wage, high-skilled jobs here in the United States. You all are pioneers, in a sense, showing how that can be accomplished. We want to make it easier for working men and women throughout this country and other companies to follow your example and to create more jobs in high technology, and that is the focus of the economic, of this technology policy, which is part of the overall plan to create more jobs for the American people and get our economy moving again. Of all of us here at Silicon Graphics, thanks for being here and uh, thanks for putting together a technology policy as part of your first month. Fantastic. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Just remember, it is the first month and we're doing our best, but you can help us with the details and I hope all of you will review it, talk about it at work, and get back to us, and I also hope we can follow up with the team on the graphics on those two issues that, that we discussed. We'll do it. And, and let me suggest to all of you that uh, while we're trying to figure out how to answer the mountains of mail with fewer people, which we're getting to, uh, the best way to communicate with us on all this is direct to Dr. Jack Gibbons, our science advisor, science and technology advisor. If you can write to him, I hope he gets a flood of letters as a result of this. Thank you and bless you all. You made our day. It was great. Thank you.